Bueno, muy buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos. Well, very good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, meeting on environmental governance for peace building in Colombia. I am Angela Maria Maya Arias. I'm a teacher and researcher at External de Colombia University and part of the this international cooperation project. And I give you the warmest welcome to this event. Be reminded that this event has interpretation into English and Spanish. Those of you who have joined the Zoom session, please look for the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and please select the language of your preference. Additionally, we're also streaming this event live in our deforestation and law uh, streaming channel and Environmental Peace Building Association channel on YouTube. They'll be recorded as well and we'll be sharing them with you if needed. This conference that gathers us today on dialogue, we approach the different ways of approaching legality in the management of natural resources to support sustainable peace in Colombia, starting from a wide view of the regulation to protect the environment and the well-being of citizens, of citizens, citizens and considering different innovative approaches in Colombia and other countries affected by conflict, we are going to discuss some threat questions. They are as follows in the context of natural resources and peace in yes, Colombia. What does legality and rule of law mean? How can legal regimes protect both the environment and the communities? What laws, institutions, and practices are actually working and which need to be reviewed and how? What are the next steps as a priority to manage natural resources in Colombia to support transition to sustainable and long lasting peace? What has been done in Colombia to use natural resources and instrument to be, to build peace? What have we achieved? What have we unlearned? And how can we take advantage of this event is with a framework of international cooperation, strengthening capacities, judicial capacities to fight deforestation in Colombia, led by the Environmental Law Institute and GGGI with the support of the Swedish Foundation. This conference has been made possible thanks to the partnership with External at Columbia University, Duke University, Environmental Peace Building Association, and, and UNDP. I'm also glad to tell you that with the editorial support of External at Columbia University, we expect to publish by the end of this year a book on research with the uh, presentation, some of the presentations that we'll be listening to today. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today in this important event. Let's within here for international cooperation. Tomorrow, we'll be holding two policy dialogues. One in the morning will be streamed live, and there will be different representatives from the government, other decision makers as well. The second in the afternoon, we'll approach these same questions from the perspective of role of the jurisdictional branch. We hope to continue to lead this type of events throughout the project validity. I'd also like to remind you that today there'll be different talks, work sections as well. At the same time with the different access of the talk and we'll finish the day with a poster session and a virtual networking session where the attendees will be able to have an inf a virtual glass and talk to other um, participants bilaterally or in small groups through another platform. So we welcome you to join us throughout the day and look at the updates about the uh, program, the, the agenda. Thank you very much, everyone. So let's get started with the opening panel. During this panel, we'll have the following speakers. Jonas Everson, professor of environmental law and ex former dean of the environmental faculty in Estocolm, Sweden talking about environmental law, justice and peace. Gloria Amparo Rodriguez, professor from external Colombia. I'm sorry, from Rosario University, a magistrate of the JEP, the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, with her talk, talk called Human Rights, Constitutional and Nature Rights in Post-Conflict. Then we'll have Rodrigo Otero, director of the Foundation for the Conservation and Development, leader in the fight against deforestation with a talk called deforestation a stone along the way the road to path to peace and finally him the national manager of sustainable development of the undp office in colombia which she leads project on mitigation adaptation to climate change and biodiversity management with a talk called 
Beauty in Peace. So be reminded that each one has 10 minutes for their interventions. I'll be reminding you when we have two minutes left. And at the end, we'll have a dialogue and discussion session where we invite those of you who have joined us today in this webinar in Zoom that you can send your questions in the QA box so that we'll pass them on to the speakers. Thank you very much again for joining us and Jonas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Angela. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be invited to give this opening speech at the Conference on Environmental Governance for Peace in Colombia. Not only am I interested and fascinated by Colombia, its culture, nature and history, but I also have some personal relation to the country. So I thank the organizers of the conference for giving me this opportunity to address matters that I'm working actively with. I have followed and been engaged in international environmental law and policy making and actively worked for many years in an international context to promote the rule of law, justice and democracy in environmental matters. So I will focus on the rule of law, justice and peace in relation to the environment. This is Wangari Matai. She was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. Wangari Matai was a Kenyan social, political and environmental activist. And amongst many things, she established the Green Belt Movement, an environmental NGO focused on planting trees, environmental conservation and women's rights. And I think this award captures very well the topic of this conference. In her Nobel lecture, Bangari Matai stated, although this prize comes to me, it acknowledges the work of countless of individuals and groups across the globe. They work quietly and often without recognition to protect the environment, promote democracy, defend human rights and ensure equality between women and men. By doing so, they plant seeds of peace. And she added, recognizing that sustainable development, democracy and peace are indivisible is an area and an idea whose time has come. These wise words of Vangeli Matai are universal and equally applicable in Africa, where she was active, in Europe, where I am now, and in Latin America and Colombia, which is the topic of this conference. And I add that while the rule of law and justice are both ends in themselves, they are also means to promote sustainable development, human rights and peace. I think she is right on her ideas and she is right about the time of, about these ideas. Is it also then time to implement them here in, in Colombia and elsewhere? The idea that sustainable development, democratic governance and democracy and peace should be seen as indivisible had been flagged before. At the first UN conference on the human environment in Stockholm in 1972, there were very few explicit links between environment, security and peace. At that time, Cold War security concerns and security discourse were essentially, although mainly of an interstate character, focusing on national defense and security and without reference to environmental or ecological concerns. This would soon change and the notion of security would expand. In the 1980s, important UN reports by the Brandt Commission in 1980 and by the Brundtland Committee Commission in 1987, profoundly challenged the dominant security approach at the time, which again mainly considered national defense and military issues. These reports stressed why and how environmental and development issues should be integrated with other dimensions of security and survival. And more than 10 years before the Nobel lecture by Vangari Matai, her message was already reflected in the outcome of the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. In addition to emphasizing the concept of sustainable development, the Rio Declaration set out, and I quote, peace, development, and environmental protection are independent and indivisible. 
Now, contrary to the Stockholm Conference, which took place during the Cold War, the Rio Conference occurred soon after the Berlin Wall had collapsed and the Cold War had ended. This had a huge impact on our thinking of governance. On the one hand, the notion of security expanded from interstate context, national defense and military capacities to include environmental security, ecological security, food security, social security, water security, human security and sustainability security. When I have studied these developments, I have referred to it as the call for social ecological security to cover the different security concepts. On the other hand, in addition to changing the notion of security, issues which had previously been seen as domestic now became international. While human rights had been internationally recognized since the Second World War, in the 1990s, the links between human rights and the environment became generally recognized. We see that in the jurisprudence established in international human rights bodies in the Americas, in Europe and in Africa. And today this is a well-established part of international law. This other side was also reflected in the outcome of the 1992 Rio conference. Namely, in the call for public participation in environmental matters. This had never happened before and it opened up a new area of international law. So far, I have only or mostly referred to environment and peace. But these elements of participatory rights, that is access to information, public participation in decision making, and access to justice in environmental matters set out in the Rio Declaration, bring us close to the rule of law and justice in relation to environment protection and sustainable development. The call squares nicely with the notion of human rights and the environment, and the Rio Declaration for sure helped set this development in motion. Not only did it push for new jurisprudence on human rights and environment, it also sparked off negotiations of new international law. The most evident case is the Aarhus Convention, the Convention on Access to Information, Public Participation in Decision Making and Access to Justice in Environmental Matters, adopted in 1998 and into force a few years later and obliging 50 states almost and European Union to ensure minimum standards of participatory rights in environmental matters. I have worked for this convention for more than 15 years and I'm the chair of the compliance committees since more than a decade. This committee examines whether the parties of the convention comply with its standards. Members of the public can make complaints or communications against the parties if they think that they fail to comply and the committee reviews these complaints. So far, we have received more than 180 communications from members of the public. There is a fourth element in the Oros Convention, which is not reflected in the title, but equally important, namely the protection of members of the public when using these rights. Thus, the convention parties must ensure that members of the public, when using their rights, are not penalized, persecuted, or harassed in any way the Compliance Committee has also examined this matter in an important case and found that the parties seriously failed to comply with the Convention. So, where in all this is Colombia? Well, we are soon there. The Oros Convention and the work in it has always been followed closely from Latin America. And about 10 years ago, serious steps were taken to negotiate a similar treaty regime for Latin America and the Caribbean. And three years ago, in March 2018, the Regional Agreement on Access to Information, Public Participation and Justice in Environmental Matters in Latin America and the Caribbean, the SKSU Agreement was adopted and it will enter into force in April this year. This is a significant step. The SKSU Agreement has all the elements of the Oros Convention and an even bolder article for the protection of human rights defenders in environmental matters. Here you only see the first section or the first provision of that uh, article, which is very bold. And just like the Oris Convention, the Eskisu Agreement obliges the parties to ensure access to information, public participation in decision making, and access to justice. And thus, it promotes the rule of law in environmental matters. And it stresses the protection of human rights defenders in environmental matters. This is important 
and an important development for Latin America in general and for Colombia in particular. Colombia has a long lasting conflict of land use and one of the worst rates in killing of human rights defenders in the world to a significant degree related to environmental and land matters. I don't need to inform you about this. You are far more informed than I am. Of course, it would be naive to think that an international treaty or a piece of national law would do the trick of turning that trend. That depends on numerous political, legal, distributive and institutional efforts and measures. And I look forward to listening to Gloria and others when informing about what is going on in Colombia. Still, I do think that the rule of law, transparency in governance, participatory rights and procedural justice in environmental context are important elements to achieve trust and peace. And I'm convinced that the elements of the SKSU agreement would add to that. It is a means to implement the ideas of environmental rule of law and justice. And now is a good time to do it. I hope that Colombia will be an active and constructive party to the SKSU agreement. Colombia's approval of the SKSU agreement would be important domestically, but it would also send an important message to the region that one of the larger countries in Latin America with an active and um, vivid civil society joins the treaty, commits to comply with its standards and support the establishment of an international review mechanism. Public participation in environmental matters is not an easy or simple road to go, neither in Colombia nor in Kenya or Sweden. It includes clashes of interest and compromises, and there is almost always someone who is not happy about the outcome of any decision or act relating to the environment. However, being able to get accurate information, being able to fairly voice one's views and concerns in the decision-making process, and being able to challenge decisions, acts, and omissions that may be unlawful, and being able to do so without the risk of being harassed, persecuted, or penalized, promotes trust, legitimacy, and justice in environmental government. And to recall Van Gary Matai's message, when individuals and groups protect the environment, promote democracy, defend human rights, and ensures equality between women and men, then they plant seeds of peace. Thank you for listening. Muchas gracias, Jonas. Eh, continuamos entonces con la intervención de la doctora Gloria Amparo. Adelante. Thank you, Jonas. We continue with Gloria Amparo. Gloria Amparo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, warm greetings to everyone, all the participants to this event. I want to thank the organizers. And today I'm going to be talking about human rights, constitutional rights, and the rights of nature in Colombian post-conflict. This is something which we could call a social state of law. The social state of law has to do with that, all these rights, human constitutional nature, nature rights. And it refers to the change of society to achieve sustainability, to achieve equality in the use of natural resources in the use of those natural resources. Well, Colombia is a country where unfortunately we have had to live for many years amidst conflict, conflict of big impact. More than 9 million people in Colombia have been victims of this armed conflict. People who have been recognized within the unique record of victims. And this calls us to see what is going on in our country and what to do with these topics. Those people have been heard and and we know about the violation of their human rights. They've been displaced, they've been threatened, they've been victims of anti-personnel mines, uh, they've been victims of abandonment, confinement, detachment. All those situations have caused that natural resources are also affected and the environment in, in general. The use of natural resources has been limited to the use or because of the use of because of the armed conflict this is interesting in the sense that not only to take a look at the conflict from the point of human rights but also from the different classifications for the effective use of environmental rights by all people who inhabit our country let's look at some figures 
the armed conflict has impacted the context because of the actions against infrastructure, the oil infrastructure. So important data have to do with this. Between 1986 and 2015, here in Colombia, a total of 3,659 types of armed actions against oil infrastructure caused a pollution to the ground and impacted our biodiversity. In addition to that, we see that in our country, illegal use of uh, lands, illegal crops, for example, some of the illegal crops, they have recorded a severe impact on areas where there's biodiversity, where there were rich soils and where there are uh, settlements. 154,475 hectares of illegal crops throughout the country that was in 2019. That's what was recorded in 2019. 2019, in addition to that, they're concerned because of illegal mining. Illegal mining, which of course has a huge impact, not only on water, not only on the soil, but also, for example, on the use and the, the enjoyment of landscape. 66% of uh, gold mining in Colombia is illegal. It's a big richness, but it's been extracted illegally. 52% of uh, exploitations without including underground exploitation is in protected areas. This requires, of course, special care. Something that has great value for humanity, and not only for this, but for the future generations. In addition to that, we also have the impact to local communities, peasants, ethnic, ethnic groups, to the point that not only the constitutional core, but the work by the ethnic people around building to walk into that path to peace, we have to consider the role they play in environmental protection and the importance of the knowledge of those communities, the traditional knowledge they have direct, use the use of their natural resources and their territories. So most of the places where we find today the greatest richnesses are located in the territories of those communities. So those ethnic groups that have been working for peace, they always suggest and propose to achieve sustainable and long lasting peace. And these groups are not only concerned about how they have been impacted, but also how they can sort out the difficulties and how we can make sure that their future generations in our country may enjoy peace and they may enjoy environmental rights and they can enjoy also the state of law where they fulfill the expectations of their rights, the rights that Colombians expect to fulfill. So we see that this territorial approach and environmental approach appears in the peace accords. They suggest the recognition of some needs, some characteristics, some characteristics that also have a holistic approach, a comprehensive approach, and it takes into account economic, social, cultural aspects of the territories, of the communities that inhabit those territories. That territorial approach and environmental approach has to do with guaranteeing sustainability of the environment and the protection of the different of the measures to build to build peace. This is happening right now in the special jurisdiction for peace, JEP, how these uh, things can unfold together. So the point, the ethical commission of the JEP, of the, again, a special jurisdiction for peace, talks about that the comprehensive system of justice, truth, and reparation and repetition should take into account these elements, promote, promote the implementation of not only of an ethnic approach, but also approach that takes into account the territory and the environment in peace building. Thus, this is how we come amongst other things that the special jurisdiction for peace, JEP has recognized territories as victims. You might remember uh, law, the law of victims, the indigenous peoples were already talking about the territory as a victim, what it meant to them. So we find here that there are key elements in the sense that the um, JEP is approaching some specific cases 
is listening to some case, especially special case 02, and there's been there's been some progress about it. For example, cases about uh, African descendants, African Colombia, so other cases about the indigenous territories, and where the environmental concerns appear to shed light on what to do not only to recognize that it's been there's been an impact of the context the surrounding and the territory as a result of the armed conflict but also what we need to do to repair these comprehensively to repair the individuals the people who inhabit the territories and also the territory itself so there are many questions that will arise about this topic and as of now the magistrates from the special uh the jep they're working on it Another important element to take to keep in mind in this approach is what is happening right now to consider subjects of rights in entities different from people. So we have some jurisprudence, we find it. It talks about the highlands, the paramos as subjects of rights the valleys, the prairies, it talks about rivers as, as subjects of rights. And here we find a new element that's very innovative. And not only that, but it requires different context. It requires a strong framework to understand, a theoretical framework to understand what that means, what elements those elements mean as subjects of rights. For example, the Atrata River to be a subject of rights, the collective rights in, in some areas are subject of rights and victims of the armed conflict. Also, this is all an element for peace building. So the construction of elements that allow us to protect environmental rights, to ensure environmental rights, not only those human rights, culture rights in this context. So there are some foundations here. One element that will require a new framework a much stronger framework that will also demand rethinking what we're doing with our ecosystems. And it also asks us to think about these ecosystems that have been impacted. And then we find in the communities and this uh, dialogue process, the way to find uh, the way to look at the horizon as how we're gonna be building this collectively together with participation and including everyone for peace. This territorial approach, the ethnical approach, the gender approach, they become key elements, but these elements given by jurisprudence will also be need, will, will be analyzed and will help us see where we're going. Finally, I'd like to point out something and it's the constitutional court has been implementing elements that are really interesting. It calls us our attention, for example, biocultural rights in peace building. What does that mean, biocultural rights? What does it mean to recognize that peasants, farmers, indigenous peoples, African Colombian communities have had the use of the territory and it has to do with their culture. They have had an intrinsic relation. There's been one of that type between the territory, the goods and services they are in their territory and their cultural heritage with an interdependence amongst all those elements, which expresses also the need, a big need to be able to establish uh, the use to regulate the use and care of nature, taking into account all those elements, environmental conflicts, that involves so many stakeholders, individual uh, at the individual level, collective, national, even foreign level. It means to face this kind of environmental conflicts. It means to take into account those elements, to take into account then human rights and recognize they have been violated. Environmental rights have been committed. So we need to make progress to build here in Colombia these elements that will help us on the one hand achieve that stable, sustainable and long lasting peace. Also the protection of our ecosystems also achieve the protection of our communities and achieve of course, the that these and future generations can live much better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gloria Amparo for the intervention. Now we have Rodrigo Botero, director of the Adelante, Rodrigo. Um, organization for Sustainable Development and Conservation. Thank you, Angela Maria. Thank you very much for inviting me today. 
I'm going to share with you my presentation. Something that is happening today in an important part of the Colombian territory, which is the Colombian Amazon, where the issue of deforestation appears to be today something that I've called a uh, stone in the road to peace. Why can we make this statement? Unfortunately, we know that in the last uh, five years, and more specifically after the signing of the peace agreement, at the national level, we have lost almost 1 million hectares, new hectares of um, forest, where more than 50% of that loss has concentrated in the Amazon region in Colombia. At the same time, together with deforestation, there's also been a reconfiguration of armed groups, outlawed groups, where there, there's been a center. They've specially grown, they've consolidated, and they've developed their operations, mainly in the Amazon region, and in some areas that match also with national natural parks and forest reserves and indigenous reservations. Nowadays, most of this territory, including the four borders uh, around this territory, has continuous presence and actions, operations from the authorities from those uh, operations, especially from the armed groups. It's also important to highlight how today in this Colombian Amazon region, we see a phenomenon that I've called the mother of deforestation that's associated to the land grabbing, illegal land grabbing, of course different from what had been happening some decades ago uh, where deforestation was focused on the change of land use. Today, what we see is a process of land grabbing that has different expressions and manifestations. In addition to its expressions, these are vehicles and instruments that enable the uh, land grabbing process. For that to happen, we need the deforestation needs to take place. So deforestation as such is a symptom of land grabbing, but it's not the cause. No, what are the elements that are associated here because of um, land grabbing? To use lands for uh, livestock, to expand the agriculture industry into these areas where there could be economic developments and break even balance also, also as a laundry uh, activities from some illegal economies and also the use of uh, illegal crops i mean use lands also to extract wood areas that are basically uh, what we call being speculated with the use also uh, at the same time of um, road roads and planned roads with public resources as well as uh, from illegal resources that they overlap in these areas with the livestock uh, industry is growing. And finally, the use of mining resources along with it. A piece of news that I'd like to highlight is in the last two years, we have again had, even though we had a decline in 2019, it was pretty significant in the deforestation process. Well, we are now witnessing that in the years 2020 and 2021, there's a new curve, it's going up, it's an upgoing trend and we have an expectation of, we unfortunately expect that it'll, deforestation will grow, but it's associated to land grabbing this time. Here for you to see this more graphically, how the deforestation uh, takes place in three parliament, three parts, Meta, Caquetan, Guavia, mainly these three parliaments and comparatively speaking, 2019 to 2020, there's a growth that is very significant. It means in the time of pandemia, the land grant process was even stronger. What incentives do we find? I mean, economic incentives for deforestation on the one hand, as I'm pointing out, is that massive process of grabbing lands. And it comes together with two phenomena. One, livestock, we're gonna see the figures of livestock, the livestock industry, and then uh, agriculture. About livestock, we should point out that it's not necessarily the business, it's not the core business for deforestation to happen, but on the contrary, is the way to consolidate these lands that have been grabbed. And what we see here is a mobilization of the uh, small, uh, small cattle that is brought from other regions of the country and they bring it here and then they move the cattle again for distribution of meat and so on. And the other thing is they use not necessarily direct impact of illegal crops, specifically um, drug dealing, that without having a direct relation to deforestation, it does cause an indirect process to use the resources 
derived from drug dealing in land grabbing, land acquisition, and it promotes this uh, vicious circle. A historical issue that we find here, fortunately, access to land uh, and uh, the absence of um, the state in regional governance. So how can we analyze what's happening today, the this phenomenon of uh, land grabbing and how today, different from two decades ago, we find a colonization of big investors, what we would call the colonization of uh, big land owners. This is reflected, this is what we see here in data such as this. What we find today is that big, very huge pieces of land, it's over 100, 900 hectares. It means more than 1,000 million per each piece of land, each uh, farm that is being expanded in the Amazon region. It may include from 3,400 to uh, 20,000 hectares. More than 20% of deforestation may be located in uh, a small group of big pieces of land and their investments and investors distributed throughout the Amazon. The location of this process is clearly, clearly determined. There's an overlap between the areas where there is greater growth of uh, livestock greater number of roads to connect to other markets. And of course, the areas where the uh, state is weaker, the presence of the state is weaker. So that is the indigenous res uh, reservations, national char natural parks and other types of reservations. So we're gonna see a group of 11 centers or clusters of deforestation and land grabbing. Mapiripan is the most recent one. It's around this arc of deforestation in this department, Caquetá, Caguan, also towards Meta, near and inside the Quinigua National Park in Guaviare, in the border here, the Vista Hermosa area, and finally, the area of Rompeviento the, in the department of Alpes, also in the border with Guaviare. We see the data dramatic data, data of how much it's growing. Last talk is growing the last five years. We have more than 940 new uh, pieces in this deforestation area. That's 300,000 hectares, a little bit more maybe, of those same eight municipalities that we mentioned before that are in the deforestation arc. So we see a direct relation between deforestation, land grabbing, and the arrival of new uh, uh, to say cows. This is, uh, of course, come small. They come small. Then they grow in these areas near the foothills and in Caquetá or in the valleys here. Now, illegal crops, they are mainly focused here in the map. These are areas that are have concentrated small areas, but the direct impact on, on deforestation is not as high as it was with um, land grabbing. These are the areas, the names, for example, Macarena National Natural Park, the Nukak Indigenous uh, Reservation. They are very concentrated there, as we can see in the map. So the historical view exercise also shows that more than for more than two decades, these areas have has have had a circular movement regardless of what the strategy has been to eradicate the illegal crops and they have remained there when you look at this for more than two decades the same grid or along the same line the same areas there it means an inability deep inability of the state to reverse this process to stop it to stop this train of territory to generate different conditions and new conditions for economic legal development and what we're going to do we're going to see next is that if you see the general line in the Amazon region, at least for these five departments, shows that with all the difficulties, there's been a trend to reduce a very important uh, decreasing trend in these departments, except Putumayo, that has a big rise, significant rise, in, different from the other departments, but it also has this trend that is decreasing. So, what's going on? Not necessarily are these uh, volumes of money and derivatives from these uh, direct extraction of drugs, what is being invested in this expansion, road expansion, land acquisition and land grabbing and the establishment of livestock. There's a new element that is here. Who has the capacity to build roads? So the response is not easy at all because there are local, there are local capacity, informal economies, economies associated, of course, and related to armed groups. But also, as you can see here, 
it, re it relates to government projects that have impact on these same areas where the land grabbing process is taking place. Of course, deforestation as well. We have some data that we should look at. There are about 1,500 kilometers of new roads, informal roads developed in the last two years. That gives us an average of more than 700 kilometers per year, which match again with this process of land grabbing. So wherever we see this joint capacity between public and illegal economies that are going into deforestation will also find this phenomenon. And that's important to identify who is doing this and what's causing it. This is nothing new, the relation between roads and deforested areas. We see that in the first four kilometers around the roads in general terms, there is great, mostly 90% of the deforestation associated to the roads. And that's not only in Colombia, but throughout the continent. So there has to be an element there and it's where the government's plans are moving, where they're moving and the initials and the initiatives from the sector. And we link all of this to environmental protection and the protection of rights. What public policies do we find around this um, deforestation, land grabbing, and the protection of rights of vulnerable communities? Well, first of all, this year, President Ivan Duque launched this uh, COMPASS uh, 4021, the first in its type for deforestation, where as a matter of fact, there is an agreement between aspects that have to do with promoting sustainable use of forests. That's something that is unique for Colombia, at least in the last 50 years, I'm gonna say, I should say the agreement of the National Land Agency who generate these agreements on the use of forest reserves is a historic uh, milestone. On the other hand, the Minister of Environment came up with a strategy through the location of the uh, course for the development of a uh, forest and it matches these areas. I think that's an important point because it's a strategy that links the topics of the rights of the use of forests, the rights, uh, uh, the generation of economies, sustainable economies based on forests. And on the other hand, the common plan with the applications or the implications to, to um, enforce the law with different institutions of the government, such as the uh, uh, General Prosecutor's Office and so on. We think that as you can see here, there is uh, under dimension in these processes. I mean, they're not, they're not big enough to respond to the demand of uh, the number of families that are located there, number two. We don't have a parallelism and the access to access of rights of land and those that are not included there and they're not potential licensing processes from previous government for example the farmer reservations that was not continued to be executing critical areas to establish the agriculture frontier and finally i'd like to point out that the colombian legal framework has not adapted itself to this so there is impunity still the legal framework is not considering illegal land grabbing of course it's not a it's not a link to um, laundry asset or for uh, it's not linked to other crimes it's been minimized within the legal framework and on the other hand we still do not have a legal framework that allows punishing these uh, processes when they create processes uh, or they deforest i'd like to point out that as long as we don't have a solution to all these social issues, the formalization of land, titling, land, title deeds, especially for peasant communities, as well as the restitution of the areas that were illegally grabbed more than half a million in the last five years. I think this will continue to happen. There'll be conditions so that this issue continues to take place because, or it's uh, governed according to the political and economic powers. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. For your ideas on deforestation in the country. Now, Jimena, the floor is yours. It says you cannot start sharing your screen. Okay, try now. Let me see. Thank you. 
Well, good morning to everyone and thank you very much for the invite to participate in this uh, Congress. The previous context explained by Rodrigo and of course the previous speakers, I think it shows us many of the challenges and issues that we're facing in our country in the implementation of the peace accords and its relation to sustainability and environmental conservation. I'm gonna be talking about how make peace greener. Then we at UNDP, we posed three questions that were developed throughout the last few years. Three different analysis we conducted at different units of UNDP. We worked on peace building and also environmental concerns. The first one where there is a local environmental legit agenda to facilitate the conditions for sustainable peace speaking of the environment. The second one, where there are funds to finance that agenda. And the third one, if there is trust in that social pact for peace with environmental sustainability. About the first question, we know that it's 170 municipalities that have been prioritized in our country for peace building. 170 municipalities out of 1,103, that's about 15% of the total number of municipalities in the country. The environmental value of these territories is really big. It's 34% of the national territory. They cover 40% of forests in our country, almost 80% of the most important areas to uh, for water production uh, in these municipalities as well. More than 86% of their areas has been somehow protected and some other some figure of regulation it could be a national park it, it could be some collective right or a special protection area being so important so what is the agenda of these municipalities to develop a piece that includes the strategy for these uh, considerations of the conservation of the environment, sustainability, at the same time generates the right conditions so that the local population may also achieve those dreams and make their dreams come true after the signing of the peace accords. So we produced this analysis on these 32,000 proposals contained in the development plans with territorial approach that were introduced by the communities for building these plans. They are basically the core the heart of development locally in each one of these territories. We found then that 21% of those proposals, almost 7,000 initiatives, these are solutions that respond to alternatives related to the goods and services provided by nature. They talk about, for example, more than 670 initiatives that have to do with conservation, restoration of water sources, a payment for environmental services, uh, entrepreneurial efforts with tourism, uh, more than 200 related to uh, four uh, sources of non-conventional injury, almost 200 to update the uh, instruments of territory ordering and others related to the use of land. So about this first question, whether there is an environmental agenda locally and legitimately, yes, there is, it exists. It's been presented by these communities. It's been agreed with the institutions and it's ready to be implemented. Now, if there are the funds, the second question, the, are there funds to implement the for sale agenda? So we here analyze three new sources of, um, or sources that have been suggested and they have an important relation to financing this environmental agenda. First one is the carbon tax. About the carbon tax, the collection for year 2021 in January alone went up to 1.57 billion Colombian pesos. These are resources we know they should focus on programs that are developed with the environmental sustainability criteria according to the standard 25% should be addressed to projects that reduce deforestation in our country. 5% should be related to protect their areas and 70% of them should be aimed at to the implementation of the peace accords with environmental sustainability criteria. The second one has to do with the uh, reform of royalties. After nine years, we assign again resources for specific destination for the environment. According to the analysis of our uh, BIOFIN program, 
find uh, finances for buyer buyer see buy a fin about 860 million 160 thousand million kilometer pesos will have to be invested here especially to reduce deforestation protect protect their air zones in areas of science technology and innovation linked to environmental sustainability the third source that we analyzed and ha it has to do with international cooperation they've made a big effort also to make investments and proposals in our country to connect the peace agenda to the environmental agenda. Very recently, we heard off precisely this week, I think it was, that there was a restatement of this commitment from the governments from Norway, the United Kingdom and Germany to invest in the joint declaration of intent for programs that avoid deforestation, reduce the emissions with a contribution of $366 million that would be assigned to the country if we are able to achieve some objectives related to those two purposes. So the resources to finance this agenda are there, they exist, these months, plus many others the country has in each one of the sectoral agendas. And then we wondered how trust was in this social pact for peace with environmental sustainability in the territories. There, back in 2019, we developed, uh, we carried out a survey on the attitudes and perceptions of peace in the in these uh, municipalities. We interviewed over 12,000 people in 73 municipalities. That those have been prioritized for the implementation of the uh, peace accords. Again, PDET is a development plan with an with an emphasis on the territory. 55% of people said they were satisfied. 38% of them were satisfied with the level of implementation. We also found out that in some areas that are important for the protection of strategic ecosystems, areas that are important also for the deforestation flanks that were mentioned by Rodrigo in his previous talk, for example, the basing of Caguan, um, Catatumbo, Locauca, and Macarena and Guaviare, all these regions, the level of satisfaction on the implementation of the peace accords continues to be low. And we also asked whether they could trust, I mean, the perception of trust in these territories regarding the implementation of the peace accords and the uh, agreement in general, most people said they couldn't trust it. And when we asked in this group of people who feel that they're could be some sort of trust, some level of trust in the territories in this process to implement the peace accords. They highlighted some institutions. So they talked about trust in church, trust in the neighbors, trust in indigenous communities, also the community action boards and in some NGOs. This shows that we need to be very aware as to who we need to build together with. I mean, with whom we should implement this social pact for peace building with environmental sustainability so that there is a good foundation. I will guarantee its continuity throughout time and its solid construction. About the third point, whether there is trust on this uh, social pact, the answer is the title of the study, the title of the survey itself is that we find lights and shadows. There are opportunities, of course, but there are still many aspects that need to be approached and sorted out along that path of the implementation of the peace accords. So what are our final recommendations regarding these uh, topics and the questions we asked? Well, environmental sustainability of peace is strictly related to trust. And how can we strengthen trust? Uh, uh, sustainable progress in implementation of the uh, peace accords, something that will benefit everyone. That's one of conclusion, transparency in the use of funds. It should be known how funds are being used and the results should be observable, especially the results that are required in these places to sort out uh, in a just matter of conflicts over land with agreements that are clear and measurable, and then building on the local proposals and relying on the institutions that have be known to create and generate trust among population. Finally, I joined the call from Jonas to the extent that we should make implement or uh, enforce this casual agreement. It gathers many of the elements that 
we need to take into account throughout this process to implement the peace accords with environmental sustainability governance and environmental governance for peace is key if we want to guarantee that these two processes are compatible and they do not end up being as rodrigo mentioned in his presentation the title of his presentation i think it was very right uh, a stone in your shoe thank you very much Thank you for the presentation. Very interesting study from UNDP. I want to thank the uh, lecturers and presenters. We're doing okay time-wise. We have received some questions. I'll try to put them together. They are in the QA box. I'll be asking questions whenever I don't have someone directly to ask. We'll leave it open so that anyone can answer. There's a question, how is it possible to achieve environmental governance? I mean, what tools, what specific tools can you mention in the struggle against deforestation, especially in the Amazon? We have talked about some solutions, we've talked about trust, but specifically about environmental governance. What tools can we uh, develop to achieve um, and make progress in the struggle against deforestation? Anyone, this is an open question. No one, there's not an addressee. Rodrigo Jimena, probably a more local perspective. They can shed light on environmental governance tools. Several things. I'm going to take the floor if you allow me. A couple of things. First of all, nowadays, there are huge possibilities to create agreements, achieve agreements with. Uh, agreements with indigenous and local communities so that those organizations create and start processes to protect and manage their territories, uh, recognize the social organizations to manage the territory. That's a key element, it's a structural element. It's uh, solid, it will break that dichotomy whether it's only from the state side or it's only from the local organization where these processes can take place. I believe the need to recognize this shared responsibility to manage the territories and the local authority is one thing, one strong piece, one pillar. Now, second, we need, we have the the opportunity after the agreements that there is an option, a tool to manage for us. We can make progress there. That recognition, legal recognition that the communities can be charged of managing the forest, manage, monitor, vigilate, and so on. And the relation to the parties in the legal framework, there is also the chance to develop uh, concession, community concession agreements for forest use. That would also allow some important processes long term to manage and to generate uh, the option that the communities project their plans. And finally, we cannot forget that in the peasant re reservations, there are other tools. There are examples how governance, local governance mechanisms can help together or with the support of the institutions and they can make commitments to create sustainability based on local models. I think that can work too. So I think there are options, but there's a need of political will to produce that empowerment. Thank you. Jimena, you wanted to add on that? Yeah, I agree with Rodrigo. And I think about the presentation we made, I mentioned, um, and we highlighted actually, how these uh, organizations and structures, for example, the indigenous authorities, the community action boards, we highlight them as mechanisms. They are legitimate. They build trust. They generate trust to build this um, green agenda to implement the peace agreements or the peace accords in the territory. So there are opportunities there, big opportunities there to uh, make progress and overcome several of the barriers that we have discussed today. Thank you. And I wanted to convene here uh, something Rodrigo mentioned. Uh, if there are some tools such as the forest uh, concessions regulating their resources scope, but they need updated regulation in such a way that we can be very similar like to Guatemala. They have a very robust governance on forest, uh, forest governance where the legal instrument recognizes rights to communities, they recognize uh, 
the rights of users of the forest. We have an association mode, but it's specifically regulated for some environmental um, authorities for non-wooden uh, uh, cases, but that's essential to guarantee that uh, conditions that the forest users can take advantage of that. Okay, the next questions, these two questions are for Jonas and they relate to the Esquizo Agreement. One of them is how, I mean, what is the role of public participation in strengthening the political will to ratify this Esquizo Agreement and how to move from a uh, standard policy development to actually guarantee access to justice within the framework of not only this case we're agreeing, but also the principle 10 of the Rio Declaration. Go ahead, Jonas. Thank you, Angela. So of course, Colombia already has a judiciary in place and some of these uh, parts of the SKSU agreement, I think that Colombia would formally comply with. The process of ratification is, is a, maybe a tough one. I mean, and before the convention is enforced, the rights set out in the convention cannot be directly applied in, in the country. So my hope is that Colombia, together with some of its neighboring countries, will, will have the, the political power and will, and that there will be a public debate to promote it. I have had some discussion with other countries in Latin America who fear, where the governments fear, that it will uh, increase the number of interstate conflicts and disputes between different states. And I, I can just tell from the experience we have in Europe that that is not the case. We have not had any legal dispute under the Oregon Convention between governments because of this. Rather, this is a way to make issues that were previously domestic, international. And I think that having access to an international review mechanism also allows for, for a, a proper scrutiny. But I, again, it's not that the SKSU agreement will immediately do the trick, but I think it would put the local rights to access to information, public participation, protection of human rights in this international context. And I think that puts some pressures on the government, but it's also positive for the governments. It's not a zero sum play that just because citizens have more opportunities that the government loses its opportunities. It can make the decision-making processes more legitimate and more just, and that is to the benefit for, for everyone. But I think that the element of an international, not a court, but a review mechanism that promotes the dialogue, which we have experience of in, in the Oris Convention, could be very useful in Latin America too. Muchas gracias, Jonas. Eh, tenemos una pregunta para la doctora Gloria Amparo sobre el impacto. Thank you, Jonas. We have a question for Gloria Amparo about the environmental impact of peace. For example, with the exit of armed conflict, there are other economic actors with negative impact on territories. What have you thought about environmental peace building, sustainable environmental peace building? Okay, the issue of the departure of armed uh, parties, outlawed groups has both positive impacts, but also negative ones. To what extent can we say this? All the, the investigation we have conducted after the peace accords in the areas that have been uh, left, where the armed groups have left, it has led to identify new species, for example, in territories. That's clear, we can see, uh, this big, huge biological biodiversity has been identified. It has increased because we've been able to come to areas where it was impossible to access before. For example, to do um, research, scientific research. That's very important for innovation, for example, also to know what we have and how we can use it best, taking into account all these environmental parameters, of course, in taking them, uh, keeping them in mind, but there's been negative impact too. For example, the arrival of legal stakeholders and also legal ones with the idea of promoting projects, economic projects, huge projects in these territories. We see here how the agriculture frontier has increased, has been extended for other activities, for livestock, uh, to increase the areas with illegal crops, of course, more area for illegal crops, that has a negative impact. 
very negative impact on the environment and also the expectation of new projects coming in projects where they are considering or they're beginning to have an environmental license in territories where before of course it was not uh, it was unthinkable because they couldn't there because of the armed groups. So the abandonment of the armed groups, they left these areas, but then something that came, uh, we see, like Jimena said, uh, lights and shadows, lights for the resources, we can identify them, we can use them, but also expectations and risks as to what will happen. Thank you, Gloria. There's also an interesting question for what you were saying in your presentation is recognizing that territories as victims implies record, re recognizing them as subjects of rights. Is that the same level? Not exactly, not exactly. The trend that is happening and notice there's something interesting The territories as victims, they, this involves collective territories, uh, African, Colombian descendants, indigenous reservations, and so on in areas such as Tumaco, Barbacoa, the north of Cauca. Notice that these are initiatives of the peoples themselves. They have requested, they have presented this claim before the uh, institutions. They have requested that we talk about their territories as victims. To what extent? In the sense that looking at the chance on the one hand, number one, to offer reparation for those territories, compensation for those territories, because they've been victims. And that we take into account also, like I said before, that relation between the communities and their territory and their use of their territory. That does not necessarily mean, but I do believe that the magistrates that are now working on these topics that become very interesting topics, in their decisions, the final decisions. These are decisions that have been implemented little by little and there'll be a final decision. They'll have to highlight what the content and the scope is, not only because of reparation, but what it means. I do not think it's, um, it's the same figure that the Constitutional Court has uh, appointed as subject of rights. It could be repaired and compensated because of the impact it has suffered. Thank you, Gloria. A question for Rodrigo has to do with the Amazon Basin Treaty. What perspective do you see about this treaty? And if you can expand on the efficiency, whether the treaty is working or not. The question has a second part. What kind of elements must be perfected to have better conservation instruments? But I think the issue of a international Inter-Amazonic Basin Agreement, just to hear your perspectives about it. Okay, it's two different intervention scales. Basically, um, they're trying to promote some agreements, regional agreements with different countries in their development models and the impact and climate change topics and not necessarily associated to deforestation. So where is the um, main point to bring the two things together? And it's that in general terms, the development models in the regions are giving a privilege to extractive industries. I mean, is there a priority? Speaking of the uh, generation of a big infrastructure and connectivity, and second thing, are there perspectives? that are very strong for energy and mining development. And of course, there'll be an impact and transformation in the territories that have uh, so have had conservation so far. It's very uneven and countries do this differently. One thing is what we see in the case of Peru, where nowadays, nowadays there's uh, big infrastructure developments that are going to the Putumayo Basin in river in Colombia. And that will have some expectations in the use of uh, soil, the use of lands, uh, different things, what's happening in Brazil, where all their perspective and the use of energy to transform mining products is based on the air of the Andes in the mountains, the Pacific Amazon. And those will be long-term processes where I'm not sure that it'll be through this Amazon treaty 
the way or the best instance to sort out that kind of environmental impact that I will be facing. What I can highlight, and it's a really important point, is it's worth it to, to say that Colombia is at a moment in time. It's the leadership we have shown in taking the initiative, something such as the Letizia impact, and it will become operationalized with the Amazon uh, cooperation treaty. It'll be a good advantage because the border areas where we have four, four borders there in the Amazon basin, they have today some con conditions of low governance where social participation may only be the actual and possible way to reverse the trends we see today. And I also believe it'll be a situation that leads to regional agreements about social participation and discussion of the development projects that are ongoing. That's where I think the opportunity is going the Letitia Pact and the um, the other agreement, the other treaty you mentioned. Another question for Jonas, I'm gonna translate. And the question has to do with the growing discussion, the recognition of ecocide as systematic destruction of the environment as an international crime and the Rome Institute and the uh, International Court. The question is, could this be a liable, feasible option? Not only that people who are just Constructing the environment are held liable, responsible, but also to build peace and justice. Thank you, Angela. This it's an interesting question, and that you related to the topic of this conference. We have the, the parallel discussion in in Sweden, in Europe, and I have participated in a few such discussions here. Personally, I think that there is a good chance, and there is a good reason to develop an international crime ecocide, and then to place it under the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court. But to do so, it, you would have to limit it to various serious crimes at the scale of those that are already subject to the Rome Statute. Otherwise, I think it would be very difficult to do so. Um, and that means that it would be to applied if it will be developed to large scale, organized, um, activities that cause huge damage to the environment. When listening to the presentations and knowing a bit of what was going on in Colombia, I wouldn't rule out that there could be cases and situations in Colombia that could fall under such a, a, a provision if it is developed. Whether it will also promote uh, justice and peace, well, possibly it can, well, at least it can be, again, both a legal and a moral um, push to, to stop certain activities. Um, personally, I don't think that would be the most uh, important and effective way to, to promote peace in Colombia. But again, that doesn't mean that it would be uh, useless for other reasons. And it could be applied possibly in some of the worst situations in Colombia too. But it has to be, I think, to be developed and applied and accepted internationally at the same level as some of the crimes that are defined in the Rome Statute today. Thank you, Jonas. I have two more questions for Jimena. They're related. One is in the trust survey of the institutions, we didn't see trust in the army and the armed forces. Was that a mission? Is there any indication about this? And also a little bit to build on the lack of trust on social leaders in the survey. As a matter of fact, we did ask about trust in multiple stakeholders, many of them, including the armed forces. In this presentation, we wanted to give greater relevance to social stakeholders that are the cornerstone for the peace building processes. About the second question they asked, the point is that yes, as a matter of fact, in the survey, what we can see is that there is greater trust on the community institutions. They don't say that it's a lack of trust on social leaders, but there's greater trust on community institutions such as the community action boards, for example, the authorities, the indigenous authorities, also the church and so on. Thank you. Question from Jose Miguel Orozco. 
he highlights that we have talked about conservation and restoration as strategies, but we like to know if you discard sustainable forest management use as a uh, environmentally sustainable option. So Rodrigo, you have experience here or Jimena, what do you think about that, the sustainable forest use? Well, if it was, I was not clear in the presentation, I'll ratify it now. I believe that that is the way out, specifically that sustainable forest use. I think I'm gonna bring it together with another question in the chat, I think from Gerardo. And it's the, um, yes, we need to have sustainable forest use, but we need mechanisms of appropriation and legal stability for communities and local organizations in the long term. I mean, we've got to necessarily reverse the tendency in terms of the occupation and the acaparamiento of tierras con derecho in land grabbing and replace it by the rights of communities, the right over the land, the right over the forest based on sustainable forest use. I think that nowadays there is enough regional and national knowledge to use, to come up with those models and uh, not only focused on the wood, use of wood, which is a concern of many people, but also non uh, wood, uh, wooden products and long-term and low impact uh, projects, keeping the forest as the main uh, objective, which makes a lot more sense. And all these legal figures that may protect the forest and not to expand the agricultural frontier. So there are two things together, the technical management of the forest and the uh, sustainable forest use and the mass long-term strategy, very wide to create and ensure rights of local communities, collective it could be or individual. There are different ways, but it has to be massive so that we go precisely and based on the generation of those rights and the recognition of their knowledge in a relation that is just application of the law and measures on the stakeholders that are doing this land grabbing because in the end they are involved and the communities are also involved and they are impacted especially those that are vulnerable so it has to do with the two reforms the technical side and the legal side and the recognition of rights as a key aspect of the governance to reverse that trend that's it thank you rodrigo well, we are running out of time. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank for all the questions that we re we have received. We were able to answer just a few, hopefully most. I want to thank everyone for their participation in this opening panel, this parent session. It was so interesting that opens the doors to continue with the discussions in the afternoon plenary session. We'll continue to approach these topics. So uh, be reminded that we will have a 10 minute break and then at 10, th I know 11.30, we come back to the uh, topics, different topics and different links. Remember that most of you, when you signed up to the event, you selected the topic or the specific sections where you wanted to participate and you received those specific links. So please, I ask you that after the break, so that you can have some coffee and probably stretch out a little bit. You may use the new links or the links that you received for the specific sessions. Should you have any um, problem, I'm attaching this email in the chat box. This is envgov.conference at gmail.com. If uh, in case you have an issue, we'll uh, resume here at 3.30 in the afternoon and then the transition to the Remo platform for the posters and the networking virtual event. Once again, thank you. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you for joining us today to open this uh, conference and all the questions that we received. Thank you very much. Have a very nice work session, the mid-morning work session. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thanks a lot, Angela. Very interesting. Gracias, Angela. Gracias, Gloria. Gracias, Rodrigo. Adiós. Gracias, Adiós. Chao, chao. Okay, bye. Bye.